Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is Dave Vellante live inside the Cube from Wikibon's headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts, and I'm on with uh, my colleague uh, and analyst uh, extraordinaire, David Floyer. Hello, David. Hi there. We're going to talk about the three-par HP announcement. Left Hand had some announcements, so HP made big storage announcement today. Uh, the company continues to evolve its its line of, of high-end storage. Um, about a year after the acquisition of 3PAR, um, HP's you know, cranking away, new V-Series announcement, federated storage. So, so David, let's dive right into it. What did HP announce today and what's your assessment? What are the highlights? So uh, the highlights of what they announced today were the uh, new V uh, models of the 3PAR, HP 3PAR storage. Uh, that's got uh, more connectivity, a higher, faster processor, and uh, a lot more um, uh, cash inside the box. So uh, that's, that's the V800 and the AV400 uh, at the top end of the uh, three -par, uh, HP 3PAR series. And uh, so that's a boost in that area. And they've announced... Uh, uh, federated storage, uh, and then they've also announced a couple of smaller items. Uh, they've, uh, to be all, to be honest, they've they've uh, added some more thinness to their story. Uh, they're now even thinner. Uh, they uh, save more and more storage, um, uh, but really, is I think it's more like putting right things that they probably thought they had before, and just uh, and just put just. Uh, just uh, make tweaking things to make them even even more efficient. Okay, so basically bigger, faster, better. Does this essentially replace the T series? Uh, they they are obviously uh, strongly saying it's a it's a total line. <laughs> you can take the T series, you can take the F series, and you can take the V series, uh, and they all have uh, different price points. Uh, they. Uh, haven't announced it, but I would be very surprised if they didn't have a, a significant reduction on the T-Series uh, to provide uh, you know, space and room for them to, to, to move it as a total product line. So realistically, it replaces the high end of the T-Series, right? It, it will do, um, but but uh, for, the, for the time being, they've got all three in, the, in their product line. Okay. Um, another big part of the announcement was uh, federated storage. Um, yeah, that's the highlight to me. Stu, that's maybe you really could, uh, an awesome feature. Stu, maybe you can bring up that uh, that slide. Um, so we've got a slide. This is actually uh, the the HP version. Um, so they call it Pure Motion. Uh, HP yeah. claims it's the first storage federation in the market for entry, mid range, and high end storage. Uh, so what what is federated storage? Why don't we start there, David? Well, so federated storage is about connecting uh, the storage arrays into a uh, uh, into, if you like, a complex, um, and they can connect it both within the data center and between metro uh, data centers within the metro uh, environment, um, and then with that, they can dynamically move uh, the workloads between uh, the uh, the different. Uh, the different uh, systems uh, dynamically. Uh, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, there, there's some really nice use cases for that. Okay, um, great. Let's talk about the use case. What are the main use cases for this? And I, I know you wrote an article today, and you've got a, a lovely graphic uh, that Steve's putting <laughs> up. Maybe you can expand that so we can see. A I don't. Bit I don't have months to create these graphics beforehand. It's just a very simple one to show uh, what's going on here. Yeah. So, 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 so before you get into it, so David wrote a piece today. It's on Wikibon. Uh, if you go to wikibon.org, you can you can find it. Um, it's uh, HP uh, uh, Pure Motion. You've called it a must-have feature for HP Three Par and HP Left Hand arrays. So. What are the use cases? Why is it must have? Right. Well, it, the, the the first use case is the the most cost cost effective of all. We did a study in Wikibon, if you remember, a, a year or two ago. We were looking at the cost of migration for a new array going into a data center, and the cost is somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and that works out even at the fifty thousand level. That works out to be about you know 43 percent of the purchase price 
uh, of uh, of a new array is going into migrating the applications, uh, the, uh, the data off that old array and putting it onto the new. So you have to allow time for that. The average time is around five months, and it can take up to 12 months. You have to have uh, space in the data center. You have to have uh, uh, extra time on the lease. Um, you've got unutilized resources. It's really a very, very expensive proposition, just migrating from one to another. And if on top of that you've got uh, lease payments and or lease extensions which are coming up on you, uh, that can uh, add to a lot of stress and a lot of overtime. So uh, the key advantage here is that you can connect um, this uh, new array and uh, connect it to another uh, uh, three-par array, for example, if we take two three-par boxes, um, and you can set up the dual parthing uh, between the two arrays and then the, the arrays themselves manage the, uh, the address and they manage the movement of data between the two systems. Um, and uh, you fill up, I think they're showing that it's nearly empty on one side and then it's being filled up on the other side. And at the end of the process, uh, you can choose just to leave it in limbo or you can just say, now this has been fully moved over and it moves the address of the volume uh, across to that new one and the SCSI address, and 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 you can disconnect at that point. So you can migrate data and then tear down the old array with no, without taking an application outage. No application outage. You can do them. Uh, you know when you want to. Uh, you don't have you. You have to always plan any migration like this, but you're not going to do it all in prime time. But you, it's much much more flexible. Uh, and, and as you say, you don't have to take down the system at all. You don't have to schedule those weekend nightmares when you try and get everything across. These, you know, these storage uh, arrays have a huge amount of data on them, and the disks aren't getting that much faster. And they, they take a long, long time to migrate that data across, even across a fiber channel. Okay. A link between the two systems. So it's a perpetual migration capability uh, for users. Now, now my understanding is the HP capability is uh, homogeneous. Uh, it's not a heterogeneous virtualization engine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, it's a homogeneous, and they've also announced it for the left hand as well, uh, which again is a, a great addition. So you've got one at the, the entry level, more of the entry level, and with the iSCSI and one at uh, the fuller and more high-end block storage. So uh, a nice coverage there. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, it, it, both of those are homogeneous, um, you know, chat about some time maybe being uh, between them, but th there's a lot of, lot of complexity in doing that. So, but homogeneous is, in many ways is goodness. Uh, this is, if you're doing this and, and your application's running, you really want it tested 100% between the two. The only other alternative way um, is, uh, well, there are two other manufacturers that have uh, stuff out. There's um, uh, EMC have federated live migration, which is a similar uh, technique uh, that uh, became available in uh, June of this year. And uh, Compellent, uh, they have something called live volume, which uh, they were like the first to uh, to actually get it out there and working. So there are a couple of other solutions uh, out there in the marketplace. Um, virtualization engines can also do the same job. Uh, for example, uh, IBM's SVC, that's the most common. Uh, the Hitachi USP or VSP can do the same job, and, and uh, IB, uh, EMC has Invista and, and Vplex as two ways that they can use. Invista? So, <laughs> but but that, uh, that, uh, that is a disadvantage. Uh, the, the disadvantage of that is that although you, can, uh, uh, vir you have to virtualize it and keep it virtualized uh, all the time, and um, uh, you can't at the end of it uh, de-virtualize it and have it stand alone working on its own. Okay. It, it, all right. So that gives us a, a sense as to the sort of approach that HP's taken, they call it peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, right. So there's not an abstraction layer, 
like you would find in an SVC, and you, you mentioned Invista, right. which is no longer marketed, I don't think. Is Invista still marketed? No, it's not still marketed. Uh, but at any rate, those engines put a virtualization layer, an abstraction layer in between, um, and, and are appliance-based. HP's is an embedded peer-to-peer -peer capability. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. And, um, yeah. What, what, I think what, the, the, the best oh. thing to compare it with is actually VMware's uh, vStorage uh, uh, motion. Uh, sorry, uh, storage v motion, uh, and and the great advantage is that you've now got the ability to do peer motion, and I think that's a great name for it. Um, peer motion between the arrays and move stuff around dynamically um, uh, without any virtualization tax overhead, um, and that's very significant on the VMware. Okay, so you, I was going to ask why would I use uh, uh, an embedded peer-to-peer -peer capability in an array versus just doing it with uh, uh, VMware, and you're saying yeah. the overhead of the hypervisor is onerous. Uh, the overhead of the hypervisor and the I.O. subsystem through the hypervisor, and, and uh, it, it, as a result, the the really mission critical applications haven't been migrated across uh, to VMware in, in anywhere like the same amount as the less mission critical. Uh, so this is a way of being able to move mission critical workloads, uh, really important stuff, but large volumes, very, very efficiently, high speed, uh, uh, both metro distances and local distances uh, with with great deal of, of confidence that they're going to get there in one piece and uh, it's excellent. Oh. I, I think uh, it's um, it, it really extends the capabilities of the storage administration to move, move stuff around. Okay, so we've talked about the use cases, what it is, the use cases, we've talked about the, the, the some of the competition, I guess you mentioned uh, well, uh, EMC Compellent or similar products. I don't know if they're head-to-head -head competition, but EMC Compellent and uh, and and VMware. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, the last question I had for you, David, is, you know, three. We've seen three par emerge from startup mode, did an IPO, reached two hundred million, and then was sold for, you know, too close to two point five billion. Um, just an incredible run. Um, and three par always was targeting that, you know, the high end of the, the marketplace, you know, we call it, some others call it tier 1.5. Uh, is 3PAR now, in your view, a tier one storage player? Have they joined the ranks of the IBM DS8000, Hitachi VSP, and EMC Symmetrics? Well, they, they certainly are close in, in terms of functionality. Uh, they've got uh, the um, uh, federation, federated storage now, the peer motion, which is really excellent uh, and uh, uh, that brings them into the fold. Uh, one of the great advantages of joining the HP fold is that they could get direct marketing of their boxes right the way across the world. Uh, that's, again, another very important uh, capability that uh, the Tier 1 vendors all have. Um, the, 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 uh, the real sort of differentiation of Tier 1 is when the... The largest uh, uh, financial institutions running the absolutely critical workloads uh, choose uh, 3PAR to do their, for example, three data center uh, 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 replication type uh, uh, applications on that. And they, they're they not there. It takes a long time for these cautious people with these very, very high value applications to do anything different. 3PAR isn't actually offering anything uh, anything extra other than maybe being slightly cheaper. So the the bar to be considered as a tier one supplier is, is pretty high. You've got to have been there and shown it and, and be part of that club to, to really to be considered as a tier one store. So we're, we're, talk, we're talking about uh, the three par as a potential. This looks like they're, they're knocking at the door. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, 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 they're and, definitely and, knocking at the door. It, um, my only concern is that by the time uh, these type of arrays uh, by the time they get there, there'll be a new class of array, you well, know, the well, flash-only well, array. Well, before we, before we talk about that, so 3 is knocking at the door. Is there anybody else that, that you... Oh, no, there's nobody else. As, as, as they are top of the 
1.5. Absolutely, definitely, they're they're at the top. They're uh, straining to uh, to to get out of that. Um, but there, there's no doubt that their their uh, faster performance in the boxes and and a wider performance capability than uh, NetApp, for example, or or uh, any uh, you know the left hand or compellent or um, okay. That's Equal Logic or any of the other similar 1.5 type uh, boxes. Okay, so it's a, boxes. it's kind of a four horse race at this point for the tier one is is what you're saying. Um, okay, now um, you mentioned we love disruption here, Wikibon, Silicon Angle, um, and you mentioned these all flash companies. You know, one that comes to mind is is SolidFire. We we've, we've been you know taught, been briefed by those guys. There's some others who are just coming out of Stealth. I think uh, Pure. Just Your came stories came out of stealth today, um, yeah. And, 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 and some Nimbus, others, Nimbus. Uh, systems um, and Whitdale of course, and we've covered Fusion I.O. very closely. You just recently yep. wrote a piece sort of describing the different areas, um, Fusion I.O. memory class uh, storage, uh, the, the, uh, the, the all-flash block-based guys, um, like SolidFire, for example, uh, right. Look very disruptive to the to the tier one space. Uh, and the interesting thing about uh, sol uh, SolidFire is they're targeting cloud service pro providers explicitly, trying to enable new classes of applications, which yep. I think is a unique positioning. Some of the other guys are sort of building up a different channel, direct sales force, and 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 going after that. But nonetheless, they're disruptive to the block-based storage guys, aren't they? Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, absolutely, they, they're now competing on a on a cost basis. So, I mean, the tier ones are, they're still not competing with the tier ones uh, because of of the functionality within the system. But they uh, well, are they're competing, competing. They're competing on performance. Would you Would you agree? They're com oh, definitely, they're competing on performance. They're, they 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 and they will get there uh, in in the, in the next three years, um, uh, very definitely, because. The, the performance and the consistency of the performance that they can offer is just uh, absolutely stunning. And, and they don't need any of the complexity of uh, storage tiering or anything like that. Uh, you know, they, they, they have got rid of the slowest piece in the, in the, in the hierarchy, which is the disk itself. And that makes huge improvements in consistency and variability. So it, it, they, they have an excellent story. Uh, they brought the costs down by, by great efficiency. Uh, some very innovative uh, uh, designs that are happening right the way across the board. Solid Fire have got a very strong uh, team, for example, uh, design team. So yeah, this to, to me over the next uh, two or three years is going to be um, the future of uh, high performance computing in the data center. So you, along with Fusion I/O at the at the at the very high end, doing the uh, extension of data and memory. So you just did an analysis of the uh, Flash Memory Summit, and you did a uh, one of your uh, courses for horses, or horses. This for time horses. it was the other way around. It was courses for horses instead of horses for yeah. horses. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in there, I think you had some projections on the market size of these various classes of arrays, right? Well, yes. I mean, the first attempt at it. I mean, it's the very early days. But uh, yeah, we, we we put one out there just to uh, to get the conversation started because this uh, this is really going to separate out three classes of of uh, solution. And in terms of number of gigabytes, uh, the the high end, uh, you know, the uh, Fusion IOs and uh, other people. Uh, uh, Flash on the on the motherboard itself, for example, um, we're suggesting that that will be three percent of the actual gigabytes. But in terms of volume, that's likely. Uh, in terms of money, it's likely to be in the order of uh, uh, twenty percent of the actual spend. So I have the data up here. So you're basically saying that, and from a storage capacity perspective, if I slice the pie, flash storage on the server, like Fusion I/O, is three percent of the capacity. Right. Flash only arrays will be just over 10% of the capacity, and yep. traditional storage arrays, mainly SATA, cheap and deep, are going to be 85 plus percent of the yep. capacity. But when you translate that into spend, and you've got relative pricing per terabyte, if the traditional SATA based arrays are the baseline of one, you're saying flash only is going to be 6x that. 
that yep. baseline. This is by 2015. Yep. And flash storage on memory class flash will be 12x. And that yep. translates into enterprise spend of 45%, less than half for the SATA arrays, and then 35% for the solid fire class flash only storage arrays, and then 20% on the Fusion IO class. So you're really projecting by 2015 a major disruption to the spinning disk landscape. Absolutely. The, the, by that time, the, uh, the SAS high performance disks will, ne they're never dead, nothing's ever dead in this industry, but the, they will, they may have a, a, a home in, in very wide striping, very fast uh, transfers of tape, sequential tape uh, between, between tiers. Uh, which actually makes them look more like a tape deck, wouldn't it? Yeah. That would be that would be interesting to be the final uh, resting home of high-speed disk. <laughs> okay, uh, great. All right, we're out of time, David. Thanks very much for joining us today to review the uh, HP left-hand three-par announcement, um, new V-class stuff, federated uh, uh, peer motion. Sounds like uh, great capabilities. Uh, um, last word from you. What's, what, what advice would you give to users in regard to this announcement and then some this of the trends that you talked about? Just get, get, get to peer motion. It's, it's uh, fantastic and uh, it's a must have feature. Uh, I think uh, it's on left hand, uh, it's, it comes free on, on the um, three par boxes. It's uh, from about 6,000 to 25K. So t to me, this is uh, a, a really good deal and it's going to save a huge amount of uh, heartache and planning and, and, uh, and cost in the data center. So get it. All right, David, thanks very much. This is uh, Dave Vellante and David Floyer signing off from the Cube inside of Marlboro, Wikibon's Marlboro headquarters. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you soon.